hatten. Jungle Book is a lasting gem in the Disney crown. Have a banana. It had a sense of perfection within itself. As an animator, it's probably the greatest film in terms of character development and how characters play against one another. Cool. The animators poured their whole heart and soul into every scene in that movie. I love The Jungle Book. I love it for its uh, vitality, for its vivacity, for its sheer outrageousness. <laughs> Walt got something out of us that we didn't even know we had. Walt's holy grail was to make great pictures. Walt could put his fingers on the total theme of a picture and a story so quickly. It influenced me all the way to go for the simple story and strong characters. You want to know something? We're good sparring partners. I had no idea, I'm sure he didn't either, that this was going to be the last animated film he'd ever make. It just embodied so many of the beliefs and, and the feelings that Walt wanted to imbue to the people. He poured himself into every sequence. Hey! It would be impossible not to look at Jungle Book and say, yes, of course, you can see it's got Walt's fingerprints all over it. I think Walt had that genius of being his own best audience, and then a genius in executing his vision of what this medium could do. He was inspiring a group of artists who never done it before. Walt attracted strong personalities, great talents, and uh, individualists like Bill Pete. Bill Pete's uh, uh, one of the greatest story men that ever lived. Someone who Walt had leaned on uh, towards the end when, when his uh, attention was being split by the parks and uh, all of the things that Disney was getting into. Uh, he had worked there since the 1930s and he was really Walt's ace story man. His fingerprints are all over all the Disney classics as a story man from uh, pretty much Pinocchio on. He had a sense of structure that was very helpful in an animated film. Whenever there was a story problem, uh, Walt would take it to Bill Pete. I'm sorry, but, but I need your help. I was taken As to Walt the developed other interests in Disneyland and live action pictures, Bill Pete's skill in developing animated story actually freed him up to do other things. Bill Pete single handedly storyboarded the 101 Dalmatians. It wasn't done that way. Disney never had one person do the screenplay. When they delivered the script, Disney said, great, go make it. And he really kept his hands off that film through the story process. So uh, Disney allowed him to do uh, Sword in the Stone, do the same thing with that. And then uh, it was actually Bill Pete who proposed The Jungle Book to Walt Disney. He said we could do more interesting animal characters. Once Walt gave Bill the OK to start adapting Jungle Book from Kipling, Pete took the film uh, in his own direction, as he usually did. He read and read and reread the Jungle Book, and he began to come up with story sketches. And he showed them to Walt, and Walt liked them. I had spent a lot of time going upstairs to the third floor to look at Bill Pete's storyboards. And I confess, the story that Bill was working on had me intrigued. I thought Bill was doing a, a fantastic job. The Sword in the Stone, you know, it, that wasn't very well received. Wait Walt minute. became a little bit more critical toward Bill Pete after Sword in the Stone. He wanted to get much more involved in story than he had been in the previous couple, and he got all over Jungle Book. There was also an additional problem. By the time that Walt headed in to the Jungle Book, he had reduced the whole animation operation so that there was a master animator who was the head of the entire operation, and that was Willie Reitherman. There was a single art director, Ken Anderson, and there were four supervising animators, Ollie Johnston, Frank Thomas, Milt Kahl, and John Lounsbury, all of whom were members of the famous Nine Old Men. And then there was one story man. And in the case of The Jungle Book, Bill Pete was really the story man. So it was Bill Pete's responsibility to devise the storyboards, to get the voices to be recorded, to record those voices. As Bill Pete himself once said, there were 40 people who were assigned to these jobs in the golden age of Disney animation. Now they were all being performed by one man, me, Bill Pete. 
Bob and I had been staff writers at the studio for approximately five years by that time. And one day Walt called us in and said, I don't like the way Jungle Book is going. Bill Pete had written a very sincere version of Rudyard Kipling's telling. He saw a film taking shape that was initially not the kind of film that he wanted to see. It was very dark, it was very brooding, it wasn't the kind of film that he'd envisaged being made of Kipling's stories. Walt and Bill couldn't seem to reach agreement on the film's development and uh, the two of them, after all those years, broke up. Pete left the studio and never returned. After Bill Pete left, uh, Larry Clements was given the job of putting together the story. Well, when he put me on Jungle Book, that was my first writing on an animated cartoon feature. Well, we were at this meeting, and the first thing Walt said, I remember, how many fellas have read the, uh, the original Jungle Book story by Rudyard Kipling? And nobody said anything, because nobody had read it. He says, good, I don't want you to read the book. Now, here's the story. And with that, he launched into a typical Walt Disney storyteller. He's a master storyteller, the greatest storyteller you've ever seen. He characterized every personality with his face and his movements and his gestures. And he launched into how he wanted to tell the story. And he said, but I want it to be fun. I want this to be a fun story, an adventure with fun. No mysterious, none of this heavy stuff. And that's what he, he looked at us and he said, and I want to have a little heart in it too, you know what I mean? Well, uh, we may look a bit shabby. But we've got art and feelings, too. In those days, we developed the story visually. We worked from an outline, not conventional script pages, but from an outline by our writer, Larry Clemens. Walt didn't want to read things. He'd rather see storyboard sketches. It was visual. You could see it. You could see the action. The whole idea of being a Disney story artist is that you're supposed to be able to take a bare-bones outline and develop the character, add whatever entertainment value you can. Walt liked people around him that were willing to try and dare, even though they didn't know quite where they were going or why even. But most of all, he stressed personality. You better believe it, and I'm loaded with both. When Walt Disney visited a project, he changed the project. And perhaps the most dramatic way in which he changed the project was with Phil Harris. We went through a lot of bears before we got Phil, and uh, none of them seemed to be right. And finally, Walt says, why don't you try Phil Harris? And of course, some of the animators said, Phil Harris in a, in a Rudyard Kipling film? And Walt says, why not? We're going to make our own, our own jungle book, and we'll do it our way. You better believe it. <sighs> Once Walt had heard the audition, Walt went bananas. He loved it. It was one of those things that kind of triggered things in Walt and got him excited. Walt cared most about entertainment. And I think it shows in, in how the story was worked out. We'd start with a, the main sequence in the middle of the picture, not the beginning, where all the main characters in it. We'd learn our characters. And then from there, we'd expand either way. Nice footage that flowed and was very entertaining. But we had no, no tiger in the picture yet. The tiger? Sooner or later, Mowgli will meet Shere Khan. I suggested to Walt in this meeting, don't you think this is a good time to just get an outline so we know where we're, where we're heading? Walt said, you guys don't worry about that icky, sticky story stuff. You leave that to me. He wanted to get in closer on the characters. The story, the plot was of secondary importance to him. Jungle Book was very difficult for me to work on. I just never knew where, where I was or what was going on. <laughs> Nobody knew at that certain point how to finish the storyline because the relationship between Baloo and the boy was so strong now that how could you possibly have Baloo acquiesce to letting the boy go into the man village? And then they got to the end of the film and they didn't have an ending. So at one meeting, apparently, Walt said, uh, well, why not have the little girl from the village entice Mowgli? Ollie Johnson, who was supposed to animate that, was appalled. He thought that was a terrible ending. Ollie was telling later on, and the more he thought about it, the way he would do it, the more he really got into it and found a really sensitive way of doing that. You know, it's very, it's very casual and, I don't want to say tasteful. And that's the love story. It's a little tenderness, a little sweetness, and also the bittersweet idea of the fact that Baloo really wants the boy to come with him, but he and Bagheera go off together. 
Kipling book is very dark and very mysterious and, and, and a terrific book. But uh, I think Walt was very, very canny in wanting to go a completely different direction with it. It's possibly, I think, the, the most bright and breezy, freewheeling, happy-go-lucky, upbeat of all Disney's movies. It bears very little resemblance to the original Rudyard Kipling, but I don't think that's what Walt wanted. Walt always wanted things that had characters in them that engaged the audience, and I think this film delivers in spades that way. Sometimes a, a storyline that's too complicated can get in the way, and Jungle Book had the simplest storyline ever. I don't want to go back to the man village. The storyline didn't get in the way of the characters. There's the beauty of that uh, little picture. I want to be like you. I want to learn to be like someone like me. That. <sighs> Since this was the last film, the last feature that Walt was really involved with, I think his stamp is on the strength of the personalities. I think that's what really shines through more than anything else. It's not the flashiest story they did. It's not the most grand artistically, but I don't think that there's ever been a better showcase for character animation. One of the things Walt Disney always remarked over and over again in story meetings was, we've got some great characters here. We've got some great personalities. I want you guys to take advantage and I, I recall Walt's words, he said, give me some good stuff. A lot of putting personality into animated characters comes from the design, obviously. And they had Ken Anderson on The Jungle Book, who did these incredible first-pass sketches at the designs for these characters. Ken Anderson started out as a trained architect, came to the studio in the 1930s, got some difficult assignments. Uh, there's a, the three little kittens. There's a, a scene where they're running through a room, and he animated this entire floor, turning in perspective. It was an enormously difficult assignment. Whenever they started on a project, they would go to Ken to come up with some ideas for character designs and uh, props, uh, settings. Ken was just a, a master at coming up with a quick statement that read a certain kind of personality. There's a drawing that he did of Shere Khan where he just looks incredibly haughty and he's got this nose stuck up in the air and his chin is sticking out. Could it be possible that you don't know who I am? Jungle Book came at a very interesting point in the evolution of animation at Disney. Walt, in some ways, knighted a group of artists all at the ultimate pinnacle of their career. Wooly Reitherman, who was also one of Walt's nine old men, was the director. He was this very weathered pilot who was also an animator, and then went uh, into the service during World War II. Woolley had been a uh, transport pilot in the China-Burma-India theater. He'd seen action. He'd led a life of command, as far as Walt was concerned. I think the animators always respected me up to a point. Boy, you know, with the large talents that were there, it wasn't easy to get respect. Woolley knew that he was dealing with people who knew that they were the best in what they did. And he had to deal with them. And they would work closely together with one another. Frank and Ollie certainly worked the closest. And then there was, I think, Milt maybe a little bit of uh, proving his, his own worth out there. And there was, I think, like a healthy competition sometimes between uh, these, these animators. Milt Kahl is all over this movie in every possible way, and he is really the animator's animator. His, his draftsmanship is brilliant. I've been through the Disney Animation Research Library looking for a bad Milt Kahl drawing, and I have yet to see one. <laughs> they don't exist. Um, I give up. The guy was flawless. Milt Kahl was doing a lot of um, animation on all the characters to sort of set them up, and then it would pass it off to, to the other animators, say, OK, this is it. No, go do it. This is just a little example. Of how you, you can see how they work together. This is from a scene uh, by Frank Thomas. And then uh, it's pretty loose. Not all the details are worked out. So Frank asked Mill to help him out with it. And when you line them up, you can see how sensitively Mill really helped him with that upshot. And the anatomy overall made him a little wider. But I, I love doing this because 
You can see the teamwork in something like this. I'm talking about like a big bear. A guy who could do fast action and dances like nobody's business. And in that wonderful King Louis scene, when Baloo disguises himself as a girl orangutan, and the two of them do that dance, that tells you what Johnny Lounsbury was. I think, in a way, the heart of the film rests on the work of two animators, which is Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson, because together, Frank and Ollie, two best friends themselves, who'd worked with Disney for many years. They animated roughly half the movie between the two of them over the course of a very short span of time. Even their name is like one name, Frank and Ollie, and their, their offices were right next to each other. Uh, you would always see them in each other's office talking about an idea. These drawings follow the section here where... That looks good. He's got hey, yeah, he's hopping up and down. And yeah. said, keep it loose now, keep yeah. real loose. It seemed like they developed this way of thinking that really went back all the way to uh, when they started here at the studio. The two of them met when they were 19 years old. And Frank had grown up in, a, in Fresno, which was pretty much a farming town at the time. And Ollie had grown up on the Stanford University campus where his father was a, a professor there. Uh, but Frank's father was a, a college professor as well. So you, you had two young guys with more or less similar family backgrounds. They're both interested in art. They both came down to Los Angeles to go to art school. And the next thing you know, uh, there's an opportunity to take a tryout at Disney. I put the, both Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston in little cameos in both of my first two films. Hey, you see that? Yeah, that's the way to do it. That's old school. Yeah? <laughs> no school like the old school. And they're brilliant animators, both of them. You get the feeling that they were constantly kind of showing each other their stuff and, and getting uh, the other's take on, on a scene. Here are two guys who were involved with some of the most remarkable animated films that have ever been made. When you go back to Frank doing the ice skating scene in Bambi and the, the spaghetti eating scene in, in Lady and the Tramp. Mel Cole mentioned to Ollie around the time that they were doing Sleeping Beauty, he said, you know, you and Frank have got something unusual the way you can talk to each other about stuff. They always trusted each other. I think the, the feeling of trust is something that pervades uh, the Jungle Book in terms of the character of Mowgli and Baloo. In Jungle Book, I think the height of Frank's talent is when Baloo is trying to tell Mowgli that he's got to go back to the man village. Um, it's a very difficult scene to pull off. It's just, it, it touches on, on a million levels. He has to rise to the occasion of, of thinking about the notion of responsibility. The subtext is so powerful. Bear knows he has to betray the kid, and the kid is completely unsuspecting. What's the matter, old Papa Bear? Look, Mowgli, I've been trying to tell you. I've been trying all morning to tell you. I've got to take you back to the man village. Holly's uh, scenes were the fun part, where... <laughs> They did the song, The Bare Necessities. I mean, the bare necessities. And Ollie's relationship of Baloo and the boy is full of fun and warmth and affection. The Jungle Book, in some ways, boils down to kind of a buddy film. You know, there's this young boy and there's the bear. And, and in many ways, that I think may have been uh, a rich experience for those two guys because they were such good friends. You can see how much they depend upon each other and the affection and fondness that there is, and you know that that's coming from the men that are animating them. I think I'm most proud of the fact that between the two of us, we got that real warm friendship to come through, and that's what we wanted. We were both striving for that, and we both did practically all of the bear and Mowgli, and we felt would be the heart of the picture, and the warmth in a picture is what Walt always wanted us to get. And if there is anybody in the world who understands friendship, it's Frank and Ollie. Their friendship lasted for over 70 years. When you look at Baloo and Mowgli, you're looking at Frank and Ollie, because those two guys were those characters. 
the love that the two men shared for each other is shared on, on the screen with those two characters. I attended a lecture that Frank and Ollie gave uh, for the animators union out here, and they ran a clip of Baloo introducing himself to Mowgli. And I remember thinking, wow, it's just a pile of drawings. It's just a pile of drawings, and look how full of life it is. It's utterly, thoroughly convincing. It has weight, it has personality, it has character. <laughs> Man, that's what I call a swinging party. A really important thing uh, about Jungle Book is the voice casting. All of the voice talents are unique and superb and spot on, and they carry the story and they carry our affections. This is probably the first time that Disney used people like Phil Harris and, and uh, Louis Prima and George Sanders, who've been on TV and in movies, very high profile, visible figures, as opposed to radio stars like earlier. He did a little bit of that in Pinocchio. Cricket's the name. Jiminy Cricket. Hiring people who, at least as character actors, the audience would recognize. So when you get to something like The Jungle Book, I mean, it's kind of the farthest extension of this idea, because many of the voice, Phil Harris's voice, for example, is instantly recognizable. Who, me? Sure I am. George Sanders is pretty recognizable. I say. <laughs> so here, the characters could be shaped around the voice. Walt actually cast Phil Harris as Baloo, because Walt knew him socially. Well, Phil Harris was married to Alice Faye, and they used to go to parties, and one day he said, I want him to be Baloo, and, and this was a shocking thing. How could Phil Harris, you know, a, a Dixieland jazz musician, you know, wisecracking guy, the sidekick of Jack Benny, how could he be a, a, a Kipling character? Even Harris himself apparently, you know, thought Walt was crazy. Like, what am I going to do? I don't do this. So I got up and I started to read this thing, and I got about half, you know, about two or three lines, and I looked over at Willie Wrightham, and I said, I can't do it. It just doesn't feel natural. You know, it ain't easy learning to be like me. They said, well, Phil, what do you suggest? I don't know what made me say it. I said, well, do you mind if I do it the way, uh, the way I would do it? And they said, go ahead and try it. I said, look, kid, you keep fooling around in here with these animals. Why, that monkey will eat you, you know. I mean, you get your roof knocked in. <clears throat> A lot of the things that are in the film are things that Harris came up with. No, the script writers or the storymen did not come up with. Harris would have improvised this right on the stage. And the animators suddenly had new life in the project. Ollie Johnson said to me that when Walt decided that Phil Harris was going to do the voice for Baloo, and they knew that they had a character that really worked, he said that was the turning point. That is one of the greatest characters that Disney animation has ever done. And everybody knows somebody like that guy. There are people who breeze through life and just kind of enjoy themselves. I mean a dooby 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 dee doo. And sometimes this actor is so identified with his voice um, that you might actually physically want to put something of that into the character. I mean, actually caricature the actor a little bit into the character. Ken Anderson used the visage of um, George Sanders for Shere Khan and it, uh, it really works wonderfully. Bravo, bravo. An extraordinary performance. And then uh, Ka, the snake, was uh, Sterling Holloway, who was uh, a veteran Disney voice. Walt said, Sterling can do the snake, and he'll do a great job. Great, great voice, who had done so many. He had done Mr. Stork in Dumbo. Which one of you ladies is expecting? and uh, the voice of Winnie the Pooh. Oh, yes, I'm rumbly and my tumbly. His voice is magical and very special. Even before he was mentioned for Jungle Book, the animators would say, oh, no, not again, which, which was sort of the truth. But Walt said, why don't we try him? And I always, I always believed in Walt. He had, a, he had a good batting average. And uh, it was such oblique casting to put him into this this uh, villain's role, and that was one of the great things about Walt. A villain didn't always have to be mean. A villain could be devious in what he was trying to do, and, and yet be quite entertaining. I have my own subtle little ways. <laughs> when you've got like, guys like Phil Harris, Bully the Bear, um, Sterling Holloway is Ka the Snake, or Sebastian Cabot is 
figure, the panther. I mean, these guys had tremendous personality that came right through the celluloid onto the screen. The juxtaposition of Harrison and Sebastian Cabot was very clearly defined the way the two of them acted it out. And Cabot was marvelous as Bagheera, as, as Harris was marvelous as Baloo. I'd like to have a word with you. A word? You gonna talk some more? You know, what, what's nice is Sebastian Cabot really kind of grounds it in that sort of real Kipling-esque world. And then, you know, they went off on a tangent and did some of these things like Louis Prima, which just, on paper, it just sounds like it wouldn't work. It's just like, where are you going with this, Walt? And then you see it, and it's just magic. And old King Louis, ba -ba -doo, ba -ba -ba -doo, that's me. We had the sequence in pencil. And he, he came in one time, he, he was like a little kid, he would he'd wiggle his feet up and down and just slap and slap and laughed all the way through it, he loved it. <laughs> Crazy. I was fortunate enough to be asked to be a voice of one of the vultures. Kid, we'd like to make you an honorary vulture. It was, I, I have to admit, probably not my thespian prowess, it was probably that I was semi-famous and uh, came from the north of England. They couldn't get the Beatles, so they had to settle for the B squad. So that's no big deal today about the Beatles. Then it was a really big deal. So it had a little extra for us when we watched it in the 60s. Today, that doesn't register, but the character does. Haven't you got a mother or a father? No. I ended up getting cast as Mowgli as a result of having done the voice of Christopher Robin in the first Winnie the Pooh short, Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Tree. There's only one thing we can do. Wait for you to get thin again. As I was finishing that show, actually, uh, Jungle Book began production and they had cast another young boy in the role of Mowgli, who was a 11-year-old or something at the time. And of course, as production progressed, the poor kid's voice changed. And as a result, they had to bring in someone whose voice they could reliably predict would last for the, for the next couple of years. And my voice was appropriate, and um, uh, my dad was the director, and uh, somehow that probably helped, and they ended up using me. I'm all right. I'm a lot tougher than some people think. They always tried to get child voices for the, the children in, in the films. It, it has a veracity. It helps the believability of the fantasy. Stick your nose out. Like this? That's right. The highlight of it all for me was I was in the middle of the session and out of the corner of my eye, I look and I see a, a shadow of a figure that looks an awful lot like Walt Disney. And a few seconds later, the door opens and Mr. Disney steps into the room. And he waves at me and he says, hi, Clint. The memory of Walt Disney coming in and saying hi is something I'll never forget. When I grow up, I'm going to be a colonel. Well, the great thing about the Jungle Book is the casting of the characters involved, that the voices are all strong personalities. They're voices that just have a tremendous physical presence. At its heart, it's, it's more fun than virtually any other Disney film I can think of. The father. Necessities, the simple bare necessities. The songs in the Jungle Book by the Sherman Brothers and, and Bare Necessity of course by Harry Gilkinson. They're some of the best, most memorable songs. It's one of the, the great soundtracks of Disney animation. And the beauty of it is that the songs work their way in and out of the story so seamlessly. They don't really start like, you know, Broadway songs tend to, and they don't really finish the way you expect a big you know, applause button kind of song to finish. Mm, yeah. Well, man, what a beat. I feel like that's a particular kind of art that's not always observed. Um, there's a tendency to make songs, songs first and, and uh, then throw some lyrics that address the story, but not so much a thought to uh, what kind of a song is this and, and uh, what is the psychology of the song? Bob and I both felt very strongly that story is the most important thing in any project. Not the, the song as a song, but the song as development. And because we thought that way, we thought really in the way Walt felt about things too. Walt had a great deal of uh, 
respect for the Sherman brothers. He did bring them in to story meetings on occasion because he wanted them to really get into the picture. He said, I hate singing heads, you know, two people singing at each other. He hated that. What he wanted to have is something happening at all times. The idea was not to stop the story, but to progress the story. Look for the spots in the action where they come naturally. Up, two, three, four, keep it up. Two, three, four. I think the Sherman brothers had a special relationship with Walt. I mean, Walt often referred to them as his sons. And even on days when he might have, he might be a little down, a little down in the dumps, he would often go see the Sherman brothers and have them play and sing a song to lift his spirits. And the songs were written by Terry Gilkison. And they were much darker, more, more sinister, more heavy than Disney really wanted to see. So who did he turn to? Well, he turned to the Sherman brothers. He turned to his boys. One day, Walt said, I'd like you to come in and create some music to tell the story in a lighter way. Walt didn't think it was much fun. And so he had us write Disney-type humorous things. And so basically, uh, the uh, original version was discarded. Terry Gilkinson, I do know that Walt wanted all of his songs cut from the film. Well, there was one song that everybody just loved and said, oh man, Walt, you can't cut that song. This, this is a great song. And so they begged and they pleaded with Disney to leave one song in the film, and that was The Bare Necessities, which is the only Gilkinson song that remains uh, in the score. Look for the bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. Forget about your worries and your strife. I mean the bare necessities. That's why a bear can rest at ease with just the bare necessities of life. Because then the Sherman brothers came in and did the rest. They were wonderful collaborators. They sprang personalities out of our music. They did Colonel Hathi's march. <laughs> Here's a military goal. Up, two, three, four. Keep it up, two, three, four. That's right out of my military experience and my brother's, because Bob was in the service and so was I. It was J. Pat O'Malley, was, was Colonel Hathi. Oh, yes, I remember, I remember the days. If I told you oh. once, I've told you a thousand times. Pop, look out! Oh. We have this wonderful little uh, bit of business where, uh, Ka is trying to hypnotize Mowgli. Let me look at you. When we first showed him the sequence um, at one of our earlier meetings, Walt liked it, but he said, uh, I think we could use a song here. The Sherman brothers were able to jump in, turn around a new song for us in a week's time. Bob and I had written a lot of songs for Mary Poppins. We'd written a mysterious melody for a place called the Land of Sand, and it went like this. Here, in the land of sand, nothing is what it seems. If that, song, if that melody sounds familiar, it was not used in Mary Poppins. One day, we were said, let's write a mysterious tune for Ka the Snake. So we said, let's use that tune, and we wrote, Trust in me, just in me, shut your eyes. The animators, I think, grabbed on to the easy-going, sleepy quality of that song. It's inventive and playful and, and fun to watch, but, you know, it's also got the sinister aspect that's, that's just great. Toward the uh, climax of the film, Mowgli has this encounter with uh, vultures who, if you notice, they happen to sound a lot like uh, a popular singing group of the time. Blimey, he's got legs like a stork, he has. You know, they all have uh, Liverpool accents, you know, and uh, the whole idea was that they were going to eventually break into a song to cheer the kid up, the song entitled, We're Your Friends was going to be sung to a uh, rock beat. When you're gone in, who winds around to fuck you up when you are down? Halfway through the animation, word came down from high that Walt had cold feet on the idea, and he said that uh, it's going to date it. 
So we had to go back and uh, redo the, the song. So what they did, they changed it to a barbershop quartet. We're your friends. We're your friends to the bitter end. The bitter end. And it was just an inside joke with us, but everybody seemed to dig it. And it was a fun thing. It was a barbershop quartet, but done as if the Beatles had sung it. And when you're lost in dire need, who's at your side? At lightning speed. So we did five songs for Jungle Book, but my favorite, it's got to be uh, I Want to Be Like You. I just love that. We figured that Louis Prima would be the ideal character. And so we went to Las Vegas, played the song for Louis and the boys. They loved it. So we had Louis Prima, Sam Butera and the Witnesses, and then Phil Harris comes in and he does his business. It was just special. Well, I recall the, the day Prima and his band came to the Disney studio to record uh, uh, that uh, wonderful King Louis song, I Want to Be Like You. We had our own recording stages, and so Prima's band was there, and uh, it was just a little too wild and crazy for Disney. But boy, we, we heard those tracks, and, and they just knocked us out. <laughs> Prima uh, recorded uh, the stuff by himself because uh, Phil Harris wasn't able to make that session. Sam Butera did uh, uh, the voice of uh, that Blue was going to do, and Louis Prima had the spot where he goes Scooby Dooby Doo. Uh, uh, read, but, you know, he did that that little spot there. Where he goes Scooby Dooby Doo, and then Sam Butera would say Scooby Dooby Doo, a dee ba da ba da, a dee ba da ba da, a do ba do ba do. We just it was just aping back and forth, and when Phil Harris heard this temporary recording. He said, I don't sing like that. That's none of my words. I don't, I don't do that kind of. So he was <laughs> getting excited. He said, well, just, just let me hear Louis and I'll, I'll do my answers. So you heard Scooby Dooby Doo. It was amazing. And uh, that spontaneity came off onto the soundtrack, came off onto the screen, and it was just an amazing sequence. But that crazy and wild sequence was more Vegas than Burbank, and it got toned way down by our uh, composer, George Bruns, who uh, scored the film. George Bruns was a wonderful musician. He did many films at Disney, and he wrote Davy Crockett, the song, you know, Davy Crockett. And uh, he was a, a, a terrific guy. He took our songs and, and made them work for the film, so beautifully and interpreted them. You know, it's not just writing a song, it's making the song work in background music and everything. And he did a fabulous job with it. I think George Bruns is kind of underrated. I think that uh, there's a lot of really charming music in Jungle Book and, and uh, you know, I think even the, the, um, the opening music sets the tone in a nice way. When we wrote the song for the, for the little girl to sing at, at the end of the film, it was woven in throughout the picture so that by the time you hear it, it's like a reprise almost. But the tune was the main theme of the show. And that theme actually George wove throughout the film. So you always had the feeling this is where it's going to be heading. So by the time you hear the song, you sort of like feel completed. You see, anybody can sit down and just plunk out a tune and write some verses and rhyme Moon and June and have a song. I mean, that's that. But to write a song that works for a film, it has to be of the film. Till I'm grown, till I'm grown. Richard and I always help tell the story through the songs. Walt liked that. I think one of, the, one of the reasons why we got along so well with the boss was the fact that he knew that we didn't care about anything but the story. If we could make the story develop and push forward, he was very happy. Everyone respected him tremendously. He was so intuitive and correct, usually. But more than that, he, uh, he respected what we felt, too. Nobody at the studio was aware that Wald was as sick as he was. He'd had a neck pain, 
And he went in to have that examined because he suspected it might be a pinched nerve. We knew that he was going into the hospital, and we thought it was about an old polo injury he'd had in his neck. And so we asked him if he was worried about it, and he says, you're darn right I am. When diagnostic tests were done, uh, they discovered that he had lung cancer. Walt was like a father figure to everybody. You just don't think father's ever going to get sick or ever certainly going to die. In between that period of November and December 15th, he kind of summoned his strength and came back to pay that one last visit to the studio. Everybody was kind of perked up. Gee, Walt's feeling better. You know, that's good. I was so grateful and glad to see him. I said, gee, it's good to see you, Walt. He said, Ken, it's sure good to be here. He was very thin and gaunt and grayed. I, I, I realized he, he's much sicker than I imagined. He came into my office and sat down. He's wanted to talk. Matter of fact, in that chair in there, as a matter of fact. And then he walked down the hall and said goodbye. He never said goodbye to anybody in his life. Said, well, I'll see you next week or something. And then he asked to be driven home because he no longer had the energy. And that was the last anybody ever saw. Then it wasn't more than another week that we came to work, and about 9.30, I remember it so clearly, Ollie came in with tears in his eyes, and he says, Walt's dead. People dealt with it in their own way. Some were in tears, some just packed up their stuff and went home. Others just sat at their desk silently. All the animators were coming in, Bill and Frank, they were devastated. What are we going to do? I believe that Walt never ever gave it a thought that what if what if would happen to this wonderful thing if I passed on. I don't think he ever thought of that. In some ways, Walt's death forced each one of them to become the mature animators that they were by that point. The mantle of animation was really placed on their shoulders. There was an afternoon late in the course of Walt's illness when uh, his end was imminent that he called my dad over to the hospital and explained to him that he wanted my dad to take over as the person who would take the full-length feature animated programs forward at the studio. Willie forged ahead and got the picture going and everybody was behind him 100%. This was survival as far as I was concerned and most of the animators were concerned. It was survival to keep this thing going. This thing called Walt Disney Animation. That was a good feeling knowing that uh, his last film would be completed the way Walt wanted it completed. In February, we ran the picture and a large group of the studio people were in to see the film. And Hazel George, the nurse, talked to me afterwards. Walt's nurse was very close to Walt because Walt had an injury and he needed massages regularly after a long day and all that, so she usually knew what was going on in Walt's mind. She had this way of talking about Walt. She said, Walt wasn't a man, he was a force of nature. In that last scene where Baloo and Bagheera dance off into the sunset, she says, you know, that's just the way Walt went off. He went off into the sunset. Just like that, and there he's gone. I think that's a way of saying, and life goes on. And I think that's a very nice way of capping Walt's career as well. It's like a coda to his career. It conveys the qualities that he is best remembered for, the personalities of the characters, the warmth of them, the believability of the fantasy. And then that magical thing, a year later, in 1967, almost a year after his death, and The Jungle Book was released. A new Disney film. And it was kind of like Walt Disney's time-released posthumous Christmas gift to the kids of the world. It was a big darn deal, and it was very popular. Jungle Book was the first picture to make a lot of money. Everybody was so proud. This picture gave the company confidence in animation, which may have or may not been wavering at the time. Both Louis Prima and Phil Harris, with all the things that they've done in their careers, they both were quoted as saying, the one thing that give me immortality will be the Walt Disney picture, Jungle Book. <laughs> Unfortunately, there wasn't a way for Bill Pete and Walt to mend their ways before Walt passed away. But uh, when Bill Pete wrote his autobiography, some 20 years later, he had a lot of uh, great and kind things to say about Walt. The key to any Disney animated film has to be the heart. In that period of time in the making of Jungle Book, 
Walt was driving it home to those guys. And this is why we're doing what we do. Jungle Book is a distillation of a long, rich friendship between Frank and Ollie, of a loving relationship between Wooly and his son, Bruce. It's a distillation of the relationships of people in that studio, the lives they'd lived, the emotions they'd felt, and they found a vehicle that they could really express all these things through. To me, it's very poetic that here at the end of his life, the last picture he worked on, it's, it sort of came full circle of the fun that he had way back in the 30s working on the shorts with the guys he had there. It may even have been the last story meeting that he had with the animators. So he said to them, gee guys, I had forgotten how much fun this is. Look for the bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. Forget about your worries and your strife. I mean the bare necessities, or oh Mother Nature's recipes that bring the bare necessities of life. Yeah, man! <laughs>